I landed my first teaching job the summer I turned 10. When most kids my age were excited about building sandcastles at the beach, weaving friendship bracelets, and catching fireflies, I was instead the person who was poring diligently over the old three-ring binders and practice notebooks, searching for the raw material to assemble a rudimentary syllabus for my one and only student, my little sister. <laughs> Being five years younger, she was the perfect guinea pig to test my prototype of a 90s pop-up classroom, complete with portable desks, chalkboard easels, and snack time. For me, it was an opportunity to create a special little ecosystem for just the two of us. And I was so excited about school and about learning that I wanted to share the highlights of what I had learned over the past year with her so that we could share in the magic of new ideas together. The more I learned about science and the environment, the more I was in awe of the vast expanse and beauty of the natural world. There was nothing that I couldn't see through the lenses of my beginner's microscope and telescope, or through the halls of natural history museums, aquariums, and planetariums, all with the gentle guidance of my mother. I was even lucky enough to live the ultimate dream of a nerdy science kid. I went to space camp. <laughs> And although I didn't grow up to become an astronomer or an oceanographer like I thought I might, the gift of access to cultural institutions and the space to explore my creativity indelibly shaped my understanding of life on our blue planet. What would be my contribution to the story of human progress? Now, many years have passed since my summer school teaching days, but I'm still fascinated by how ecosystems work in nature, institutions, and the classroom. I pursued a career in sustainability and social impact using film, games, and tech to help people better understand and take action on climate change. My work centered around consulting and social impact. But eventually, the teaching bug bit me again, because there's something special about the particular kind of magic that you find in the intellectual microcosm of the classroom that you cannot find anywhere else. So today, my students are future chief sustainability officers, nonprofit leaders, and social entrepreneurs hungry to use their education and their talents to make the world a better place. They want their lives to have meaning and they want to be able to pay off their student loans before 2070. But they are grappling with social, political, and climate upheaval that is unprecedented and for which we have no historical blueprint, where the once reliable rules of engagement and norms of respectful cooperation can no longer be taken for granted. So we've seen and experienced contentious elections before, but never have we experienced the radicalization of a political party that created a system where the possibility of not having a peaceful transfer of democratic power even became a reality. And fake news and alternative facts are not new phenomena, but the ease and speed with which modern technology allows us to disseminate dangerous lies and conspiracy theories is unprecedented. Climate scientists have been sounding the alarm for decades that our burning of fossil fuels is increasing greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere and pushing our planet beyond livable temperatures. And just recently have reported that the last eight years were the hottest on record since we started consistently tracking the historic data in 1880. So with these and many more pressing issues that are unfolding, where are students supposed to make their impact? Clock is ticking. We need a new blueprint, something that helps us to wrap our minds around deep intersectional challenges, measure impact, and help to communicate across the partisan divide. We need more people who are ready, willing, and able to engage in the noble work of building a more just, inclusive and sustainable world. 
and educators can be that catalyst for change. So in the ecosystem of my classroom, teaching is a form of activism. And as the great black feminist author and social critic, Bell Hooks, so beautifully challenges us to create an opportunity to transgress and to push beyond the boundaries of oppression to find freedom. Our classrooms can be the gardens to cultivate critical thinking and model intellectual courage. The forward momentum of human society rests on our ability to share and co-create knowledge together. That movement and flow of ideas shaped and reshaped is what allows us to drive the system forward. And those things are often in tension with the way that we develop and collectively understand those norms and beliefs. So that ecosystem of ideas and the social contract that binds us together matter. Who gets to participate in system building matters now more than ever because ideas power the world. Now, systems change work to build a more just and inclusive society is happening in parallel with other trends. Political scientist Robert Putnam wrote about the decline in social connectedness and civic engagement and the importance of social activism and community renewal. Writer and activist Jane Jacobs advocated for a vision of urban renewal during a time of rapid suburbanization and gentrification, where the weird wisdom of diverse cities was a way to preserve the vitality of civilization. They and others pointed to significant shifts in how we as people engage with each other and how we build community. Today, we are living through a period of declining trust in American institutions that were once thought of as cornerstones of society. Everything from organized religion, government, banks, uh, mainstream media, big tech, marriage in the nuclear family, the 30-year mortgage, and now the nine to five. Higher education is not immune to this decline in confidence. But around the world, colleges and universities, wonderfully imperfect, are still some of the few institutions that comparatively hold the public trust. And globally, education remains the most powerful tool that we have to lift people out of poverty, advance gender equity and the rights of women and girls, and to close the ever-widening wealth gap. American higher education system has long been the envy of the world but we are concerned about access, affordability, and the return on investment. The commodification of education has put a big price tag on achieving a piece of the American dream. Universities aren't only in the business of education, they are in the business of preserving democratic values. Just like democracy, the very existence of the university rests on the ability to protect and promote free speech practice through the free exchange of ideas and civil discourse. This is the bedrock of intellectual freedom and a key ingredient for a healthy civil society. But increasingly, academic freedom is being attacked. And if the last few years have taught us anything, it is that democracy is resilient yet fragile and only works when people are engaged and informed. For me, casting my ballot was no longer enough. I've been serving as an elections inspector since the 2020 presidential election, helping to run the polls, our engine of democracy. Here in New York State, more than half of all poll workers are over the age of 60, making them particularly vulnerable during the pandemic and creating a shortage of poll workers. You can reach out to your local board of elections and learn how to get trained so that you can help run the polls where you live. Know anyone who's turning 18? Encourage them to get registered to vote. Democracy is resilient, yet fragile. Democracy is resilient, yet fragile. We cannot take our freedom to vote, to learn, to love, or to express ourselves for granted. The classroom is a place where young people can practice democratic values, grapple with intellectual discomfort, and imagine what society would look like with a new social contract, 
one that is purposefully designed to serve both people and the planet. A new social contract that accommodates for the practical challenges of advancing the common good when our own self-interest is so gratifying and we've been primed for hyper-individualism. Even when we genuinely care about the well-being of others, it's so easy to prioritize our needs, wants, and comfort. Because if there's one thing that every person wants for themselves, it's more. More of something, more of everything, more time, more money, more love, more energy, more freedom, more wellness, more power, more opportunity, more of whatever it is that is important to you and makes you feel alive like your life has momentum. A scarcity mentality does not unlock our greatest human potential. We crave a life of true abundance. But somewhere along the way, we got caught up in the seductive capitalist cycle of consumption and greed, and now struggle to become happy with having just enough. A few years ago, I did a wilderness survival training with BOSS, the Boulder Outdoor Survival School. No high performance gear and no tech, except for a basic point and shoot camera and a compass. The meditative practice of traversing the rugged, majestic wilderness of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument and Dixie National Forest in Utah with a group of strangers and just the essentials in my blanket pack, that taught me the true meaning of the boss motto, no more, carry less. So maybe if we seek abundance from a different source or for the right purpose, we could create a new social contract that serves both people and the planet. Nature is abundance, and abundance is nature. The world's problems are highly complex and intersectional and high stakes, and people have increasingly diverse identities, making it hard to collaborate to achieve consensus for a common purpose within the larger goal of systems change. It's so easy to just opt out of working together and to say, not me, not here, not now. That's someone else's problem over there. But our thriving and our futures are fundamentally and inextricably interconnected. So what does a new social contract look like and how do we go about creating one? I admit that is a very big question and I wish I had the perfect answer. To start, we can think about the relationship among economy, nature, democracy, and technology. What we have now is an economy that is not purposefully designed to sustain life, and it's in decline. We will never achieve shared abundance by continuing along the old path of generating profit by extracting natural resources and exploiting people. We are moving along a new path with the help of movements like B Corp, the nonprofit network transforming the global economy to benefit all people, communities, and the planet. And if a technology is adopted and utilized at scale by the public, it must serve as a tool to advance democracy. Technology connects us, and it's a way for us to imagine our shared future. We imagine mobile phones in Star Trek and FaceTime in 2001, a space odyssey. And then we made them real. The future is always in the making, and it must include everyone. But we are leaving people behind. The pandemic both highlighted and exacerbated the digital divide, the gap between people who have access to modern information and communications technology and those who don't. Low income and rural students who lacked home internet access and personal computers struggled to participate in online remote learning and experienced higher levels of learning loss due to digital inequity. And artificial intelligence is only as equitable as the algorithms and data sets that we use to train it. We are already seeing how a lack of diversity among AI developers and researchers is perpetuating historical patterns of systemic discrimination, like when people with black sounding names are targeted for predatory lending, or facial and voice analysis screens out people with disabilities, like a speech impediment or autism, making it harder for them to gain employment. 
If technology undermines inclusion, it will undermine democracy. And we will never have a society in which everyone can fully participate and is granted the opportunity to engage fully economically and socially. To support the development of a new social contract, I propose an interdisciplinary decision-making movement building framework called Ecological Principles for Collective Action. It would utilize existing practices and principles like design thinking, the work of grassroots activists, indigenous wisdom, and biomimicry, learning from nature to support sustainable design. Leading with the philosophy that nature did it first, and did it better, the goal would be to map collective action problems like climate change and voter suppression. With a combination of big data and insights from social and environmental ethics of diverse cultures to enable leaders to articulate vision and values in times of rapid change and uncertainty and to build better narratives and frame them so that we can create next generation institutions. Ecological principles for collective action must be a globally informed practice, not only a Western-centric one. And because people have so many intersectional identities and it's hard to collaborate collectively to achieve a better world, the challenge is to affirm our diverse identities but interrogate our values. Because even when we believe that our values are shared, they might be unexamined. And negotiating our values is at the core of a new social contract. So where might ecological principles for collective action live? Well, in a shared network of institutions, including colleges and universities, where students could play an integral role in developing the principles and practicing the problem solving and leadership skills needed for the world they are inheriting. Beyond the universities themselves, cities can be incubators of practice. We're already focused on cities as hubs for sustainable living, and for innovative action against climate change. And universities can't just pick up and move like a corporate headquarters or a factory. They have to be invested in their communities for the long haul. I'm in this for the long haul. To learn as much as I can from nature, to build better institutions, and to create a new social contract, one that better serves all people and the planet. Let's get started. I'll see you in class. Thank you.